Right. Have you seen this diagram before? This particular diagram. Does anyone know what the name of this is? Yeah, um, so it's supposed to make user interfaces very easy, right? Instead of model view controller, you have actions and dispatcher and action creators and, and store and views and view controllers and some other stuff. All right, so what about this diagram? Do you recognize this? Um, it's supposed to make event-driven programs somehow, you know, composable or uh, observable. And finally, now you have propagation of change. I mean, what, what, what does that mean? And this thing here, now that you know we have diff and patch and sort of virtual data structures, finally UIs are declarative, right? Of obviously, so virtual becomes declarative. I mean, why? This is the state of JavaScript in 2015. Uh, like, what happened here, you know? Are we over-engineering our apps or have we actually found a better way of building stuff? And if it's better, then why is there so much to learn? I mean, why, is, why, why isn't better simpler? And why isn't better sort of like more obvious for us? That over there is a sunflower. And the, the center part of the sunflower has these seeds that form this beautiful pattern, which is actually governed by the golden ratio. So think about the golden ratio for a while. 1.618, 0, 33, et cetera. It sounds like an arbitrary sort of made up number, but it actually occurs in nature and it creates these things like this. So what if there would be something like this for JavaScript? So a pattern which is natural, it just happens to be there, um, but it's still sort of beautiful and complex, and you, you can understand it. So I've been ex studying how to apply reactive and functional programming for user interfaces, and I stumbled upon this interesting architecture, which I want to share with you today. Have you tried already virtual reality? So first time I tried it, there was this demo scene. You just see the table and some objects on the table, and the first thing you, you feel is like, I want to touch this, and it's, it's, it's kind of so engaging as like your favorite single player campaign game, where it's not a story, it's not a movie, it's real interaction, you feel like you're there. So why does this happen? What is going on here? So this is called user, um, no, sorry, human-computer interaction. So like a conversation is, both parties listen and speak. So if we zoom into the computer, what will we see? Well, this the desktop tower or the processing unit. And in between, we have this thing called interface, which is normally comprised of the screen and the mouse and the keyboard, these kind of things. Now, notice there's this cycle structure where information is inside the computer. It goes onto the screen. You see that with your eyes, and you decide to do something with your hands on the mouse and keyboard. That triggers another change to the computer, and that generates another screen, and it keeps on going. So all user interfaces can be expressed as cycles. This is our first insight when we're trying to find an interesting and natural architecture. And actually, I challenge you to find a UI that doesn't work on the low level as a cycle. So in this system, the interface devices are often called input device and output device. Right, the graphics, you know, graphics output and that kind of stuff. So whenever you have an input and an output, what do you have in between? What is the best candidate? Yeah, a function, right? So X is your mouse and your screen is F of X. So UIs as functions. So the computer's role should just be a function, right? Whatever you put on the keyboard uh, and the screen should be your output as a function. So remember the terminal programs that sort of prompt for your input. These were blocking UIs. So the computer will do nothing until you do something. And modern UIs are not like this anymore. Instead, they are non-blocking. So with this autocomplete field, the computer is simultaneously processing while uh, you are typing. So there's no need to sort of wait until the user ends. That, that, that just doesn't exist. So if we would draw these events happening on timelines, this is roughly what we would see. Uh, the top timeline is what you input, and it runs in parallel to the bottom timeline. 
although the bottom timeline is a function of the top one. There is no such idea as wait or, you know, wait until the other side stop. It stops. And this so happens to be the definition of asynchronous. It's whenever there, one side is allowed to con continue its processing regardless of what the other side is doing. So that's another one, that UIs are asynchronous by nature. Or should be. We don't want blo blocking UIs. What else? So the computer has all these kind of devices to make um, its interface. But what about you as the user? Don't you have your biological devices? For instance, your eyes and your hands, right? Those are sort of your devices. One of them is part of your senses, and the other one is your instrument of expression. Now, your devices are connected to the computer's devices, right? Your, your eyes are sort of looking to the screen. So, but isn't the computer, um, doesn't it have also senses, for instance, the mouse is how the computer senses the outside world, and the computer's ears would be its microphone. And also, the computer's screen is how the computer sort of expresses its own feelings or opinions. Right? So, there's a symmetry here where both sides have senses and both sides have expression. And that's another insight. The UIs are symmetric with the user. So, the computer is symmetric with the user. And if they are symmetric, then just as the computer has an input device and an, out and an output device, so do you have an input device, your eyes, and an output device, your hands. Whenever you have an input and an output, what do you have in between? A function. So now, your brain is a function. Now, this is a bit philosophical because are you a referentially transparent function? Are you non-deterministic? If you would see the same screen at the same time, at the same place, would you do the same thing? Now, we don't really need to answer that question. We don't need to worry about that. Why? Because you don't have a time machine. You can't go back in the past. We cannot go and check if you would actually do the same thing. So we can just assume that, yeah, let's assume that you're going to do the same thing if we would go back in time. So you are sort of deterministic. And this is what you do as a function. When you see JSConf Buddha uh, no, Budapest side, yeah, you emit some scroll events as your output and you see something interesting and you click on it. So the input is what you see from the computer and the output is what you do with your hands. So let's try to explore the final insight that the user could be a function as well. That's our, we have now nice five insights to build something. But we have sublime text open, and all that was interesting and nice philosophy, but how do we get coding some actual JavaScript? So let's start with a relatively easy one. Probably the smartest people in this room can make a function that, given a string of the URL, renders um, as an output the screen of the website. But it's not a function from a string to a screen. Why? Because that would be a blocking function. It would be, you know, we don't want to do that. So it's a function from that weird arrow to this weird arrow. So what are these arrow thingies? Well, to me, they kind of look like fruit skewers. Or, you know, well, yeah, well, sorry. Um, so how could we express these food sticks in JavaScript? Well, we have the first cucumber, and uh, first tomato, second cucumber, etc. These are sequences. So we could probably use an array, right? That's what JavaScript gives us for basic sequences. And Arrays in JavaScript has, have these functions sort of map. So here we are multiplying each item by 10. And we also have filter as a function over arrays, which is kind of like removing an item, except we are creating a new array instead of changing the previous one. So it does look like our fruit skewers could have this map function, right? I don't see a big challenge in doing this. And they could easily also have a filter function. But there is a big problem why uh, these things cannot be erased is because of this arrow meaning time, right? And these dots are just things happening, which is the definition of an event. So our fruit sticks are kind of, you know, event streams. That's what they are. What's the difference with array? Well, an array is a sequence in space, and an event stream is basically a sequence in time. 
And for sequences in time, you can do fancier things that arrays cannot do. For instance, you can delay each item by one second. And also, uh, uh, event streams can be infinite, so there will always be the next hour from now, even if this planet stops existing, while arrays have to be finite. And not just delay, but you have many other functions like merge and window and combine latest and with latest from and flat map. So <laughs> now we know that the computer uh, is not a function from a string to a screen. It's a function from an event stream of string to an event stream of screen. And we could name the top one as interaction events, is whatever you do as a user, and the bottom one as screen events, is whatever the computer generates. So if we would write in JavaScript, actually TypeScript here, just to show the types, this is roughly how we would get started. And we just need to fill in what happens inside that function. So all event streams have this listen method, which is really what you expect it to be. It's kind of like add event listener for clicks. So no mystery on this part. Now the user function will do the opposite, right? As we saw, it will take the screen events as input, and it will generate interaction events as output. But how can you write this in JavaScript, right? We'd need your, we would need your brain for that. So no can do. So we can actually decompose the user function into smaller functions. First, this screen event is rendered, uh, is put to the DOM, and the DOM with the browser shows that on the physical screen. That goes to your eyes, and then your eyes send the signal to your brain, and your brain takes some time deciding what to do, and then finally you decide, okay, I'm going to click that, and that triggers a, an event on the DOM event dispatcher. So we only need to care about the beginning and the end, which is the DOM, right? The DOM will be the ambassador for our user, or the proxy for our user. And the other functions are just living in another world in JavaScript. So they're still part of our user function, but we don't have direct access to them. It's as if you know, they were living on some remote server, and we're using the DOM as the client to access that. So in JavaScript, it would look like this. We um, first start with uh, this given screen event stream. And we can listen to each screen event and render that to the DOM somehow. Then we create a uh, plain empty uh, event stream called interaction events, which is what we will return at the bottom of the function. So then we listen to all possible events happening on the DOM. So this star there doesn't actually exist. It's just to illustrate our idea. And this probably is not performant either, but it's just to show you that we can write this function. And so we, whatever we listen to, anything, we just uh, forward that to interaction events. So, and we're done. So the user function is written, and we can also listen to what it, what it outputs. Now, if you put both function applications together, you get this. And now we have kind of like a serious problem because, um, well, if you can't see the problem, I'm going to rename these so it's, it's, it's easier to see. Can you see it now? Well, if we replace A with F of B on the second line, you get this. And now you can see the problem because B is undefined on the right-hand side, so we just can't do this. It's because this equal symbols means assignment, right? That's where a complication is coming from. You can't assign from a thing that doesn't, ex you know, yeah. So we have other types of equals in JavaScript, for instance, double equals and triple equals. So the equal symbols in mathematics means an equation. So what if we just forget assignment and think of an equation to solve this? And this is actually a special type of, of equation because it's a fixed point. That over there is the definition of a fixed point. It's whenever x is f of x. And it's pretty common in mathematics, like the co cosine has one. So what if our problem would be actually to discover this, the event stream that satisfies this equation? So let's forget assignment and instead consider equality. Let's use mathematics as an inspiration. So we're back into the dangerous, unmathematical world of JavaScript, and uh, assignment will not help us here. The complication actually is that, well, the second line doesn't have a problem at all, but the first line has a problem because it needs to exist before we call this computer function. So what if we just do that? Like, 
With this line, we declare interaction events as an empty event stream. What is an empty event stream? It's just an empty fruit skewer with nothing on it. Quite uninteresting. And then now that it's available, we can call the computer function on it, and we get this screen events as output, naturally. Now that screen events is available, we can uh, apply the user function on it, and we get interaction events two, a second one. So what have we just achieved with this piece of code? Well, when we call the computer function on an empty event stream, we got this uh, screen events, which, by the way, starts with this default screen. Why? Because, well, if you don't interact with the computer, at least you see this login screen. So, and then now we apply the screen events on the user, and we got this real uh, interaction events coming from the real user. But we have these two um, interaction events. So we just need to sort of copy-paste whatever happens on the bottom one back into the first one. So with this, whenever an event happens on the second, it will be replicated back into the first. And then we have sort of closed loop. So in JavaScript, this would be actually about listening to whatever happens on the second and just forwarding that to the first. And we can also simplify this code by getting rid of um, intermediate variables, so this is not a scary operation, okay? Um, no magic. And we can do that again with screen events, and we get this. So hopefully now you see something that looks like a fixed point, right? I mean, you can compare B with interaction events, and you can compare G of F with user uh, computer. And it's solved, right? It wasn't that hard after all. But there's something that still annoys me with this computer function, because in reality, it would be a huge function. So in a real JavaScript application, this would be thousands of lines of code, because it should do networking and rendering and calculations and whatnot. So how can we improve on this? So model view controller is older than I am. So it's been around since the 70s and 80s. Uh, and this is, the rough, this is roughly the same diagram from the 80s. I didn't really change this. And there's two things I really like about this diagram. And first of all, is the user. So with all these fancy architectures for user interfaces, we kind of forgot where does the user plug in into our system, right? So I, I like it that, that it's here, and we should probably do this more often. The other thing that I like about this diagram is that it almost looks like that cycle, cycle diagram that we saw some minutes ago, right? Except there's one big difference, is that there's no arrow from the mouse to the screen, while there is an arrow from a, con a controller to a view. So MVC is not a perfect cycle, and we just can't name this MVC. But it does look like those could correspond to model, view, and user, but then we don't know how to name the mouse because it's the complicated bit. It cannot be named controller. So do you know what was the original idea in MVC and Smalltalk, forgetting all these routes and backends and stuff? Um, it was actually, in their words, to bridge the gap between the digital information of the computer and the user's mental model. And that's what they said. So the computer speaks bits, zeros and ones and bytes, and you speak English, Hungarian, and cat pictures. So that's what the view does, right? It translates from zeros and ones to English and cat pictures, right? If we're talking about two languages, and, and the view just should just bridge that gap for you. So why not? The other direction should just be translating from cat pictures back into something that the computer appreciates, right? You're giving sort of, you're making a request to change something in the computer, and you're giving that in sort of human terms, a mouse and a keyboard and whatnot. So I call this thing intent, but you can name it whatever else you want. I just like this name because it means an, 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 uh, an interpretation of what the user is trying to achieve in the context of the digital information. So it turns out this big, massive computer function can be decomposed into smaller functions, intent, model, and view where intent translates the user's interactions, the model does the heavy lifting, and the view translates it back to cat pictures. And if you're not satisfied with, these, with this decomposition, you can split it into two functions, or you can split it into six functions. I don't care. So these are just functions. And as a good programmer, you should know when to split a function whenever it gets too big, right? 
Well, this is roughly what my framework called cycle.js does. You can find that in, it in that address up there. And the event stream that it uses uh, come from this library called rxjs, a reactive library. Now, what cycle.js does is basically solve some problems with this code that we wrote some minutes ago. First of all, this is boilerplate, right? We don't want to write that in every app. And this is mutation, and it's also boilerplate. We don't want to write that every time in our code. And then we have two event streams to represent the same thing. One of them is the proxy, and the other one is the real one. We attach them to each other. So if all, all of this mess, you just want to care about this part, right? You want to specify, as a programmer, how does the computer work in this user interface. So that's what Cycle allows you to do, is just to specify one function, and it does the rest of the loop for you. And this is the API, basically two functions. Actually, for this presentation, we just need apply to DOM, where we give there the computer function, and we say where in, in the DOM will this live, so the container there. Let's see how we can use this. So imagine a hello, basic Hello World program where there's this one big input field where you insert the name and the header just greets the name. Let's try to code this quickly. So we can call apply to DOM giving ID app as a pointer to where on the DOM should our app live and the computer function as the second parameter. If you call interactions.get, it will return you an event stream. So you give dot field as a selector and input as the event type. So this will, this will return us the event stream of input events on the dot field element. So we don't have that yet, but you're going to see it soon. And I call this change name dollar sign. And dollar sign is just a convention to say that this is an event stream. You, you don't really need it. So name stream will represent the actual data that we will display. So it needs to have an, an initial value, so we just choose empty string. Otherwise, it just takes everything that comes from change name stream. And then we convert name stream into screen stream by mapping every name to a div that displays this data. So notice now that we have this uh, input element with class name field. And now it makes sense how this will work because with the first line there. It's, after all, a cycle, right? And then we just return uh, at the bottom screen stream. We can also rearrange this code by doing something which is not magical, don't be scared, and we get this. So just rearranging. So literally, what the, key, what the computer does is translate from keyboard to screen. You can clearly see that in this function. It gets uh, interactions events from the keyboard, and it generates the screen. So remember that, of course, we can refactor this computer function to smaller functions, composition of intent, model, and view. So how would it look like if we would split it like this? Well, first of all, the intent would take care of interpreting whatever the user is trying to do. And this function just wraps those two parts that we're doing. So whenever we get an event of input on that field, we just get what is the value inside that element. And then the model takes care of, uh, of taking whatever happens on change name stream from the intent and just makes sure that it starts with some initial data. Then the view converts the model's name stream into these divs. And finally, the computer is just a function composition of these three. So you choose. You can either do it like this, or you can do it like that, or like this. It's up to you as the programmer. So what have we just made here? Model, view, user, and intent are functions. And between each of them is an event stream. So name stream is the output of the model and the input of the view. And screen stream is the output of the view and the input and of the user and so forth. And guess what? You know, this is unidirectional data flow. And this thing here was functional programming and immutable techniques. And these food sticks were, you know, reactive programming. That's another name you can give to reactive programming other than reactive programming. Food sticks, yeah. And the divs that the view creates, they are using the virtual DOM. So it turns out that not all of these concepts were that scary after all, right? I mean, 
we saw that most of, most of these actually just emerged naturally from those in, in insights that we got from user interfaces. Oh, and hey, one last thing. Remember the human-computer interaction. What happens if we replace the computer with another human? I mean, if the computer has senses and expression, can't we just replace the computer with anything that has senses and expression? So what if this model here can actually represent any kind of interaction, whether it's computer and a human, or it's a human and a human, or it's a computer and a computer, etc. So in, a, in an interaction with another human, you take um, input words with your ears, and you output words with your mouth. Right? So when Alice hears her friend Bob saying, what's up, she processes that in her brain, and she outputs her answer. The event stream of Alice's words is her part in the interaction. And then when Bob takes Alice's words as input, he also makes an answer. So it turns out that Alice's words are an event stream as a fixed point of the composition of Alice's brain with Bob's brain. So if we merge uh, Alice's words with Bob's words, we get an event stream of words from both of them, which is what you know, we normal humans name as just a conversation. Thank you. Let's have a sit on this awesome, awesome seat. So from what I've noticed, there were no questions on Twitter. Okay. I'm a little bit disappointed. But um, we have someone with a mic, so if there are any questions for the audience, anyone? Can't see anyone. Seriously? Any, oh, there's yeah. a question over there. Awesome. OK, thank you for your interesting presentation. and. Uh, you wrote some uh, markup in the JavaScript. Uh, does this framework or something use uh, React or something different? Yeah, um, is this mic still? Yeah. Um, yes, it, it actually doesn't use React. It uses virtual DOM, um, virtual dash DOM. That's the name of the library. Uh, basically, because I want to get the diff and patch um, algorithms, and, 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 and I want to use them in the framework. So React doesn't provide that. Um, but on the other hand, uh, the community around CycleJS just made this Cycle-React, which where you can use uh, React there. And also, the, the markup, you can use JSX with Cycle, but normally I use this virtual hyperscript, which is just an H function, but you could use JSX as well. Thank you. Any more questions? Yay! Hi, uh, last time I saw Cycle uh, uh, yes, uh, GitHub page is under development. Is uh, this yet or production ready now? Um, yeah, so this is not production ready because actually I'm redesigning it quite a lot. Like, so the first version I made was, had a completely different API than this, and if you would build a production, API, uh, uh, production app on that, it would have you know, been like Angular 2, but instead of that effect, it would be Angular 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7. So because this is really new stuff, and sometimes you just really get it that, OK, this is like I need to remake this because I actually discovered that I need to do this better. Um, but finally now, I think we're converging to a very nice API. I don't, I don't think I can get nicer than this. So soon en enough, I think maybe you know, a couple of I can't promise anything, but, you know, yeah. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Uh, we still have some time, so maybe another question. There it is. See, you won't ask questions. Why won't you ask questions on Twitter? <laughs> no internet. <laughs> That's true. Yeah, hello. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, how to handle errors in this reactive pattern? Should I put errors on the same in screen stream or, for example, on that conversation between Alice 
the errors should go to the same stream or some um, uh, individual stream? Yeah, so RxJS, this library for event streams, it has these uh, error handling operators already for yourself. And when you watch uh, Matt's presentation about Rx, he's going to explain it completely. You're going to see that, yes, you can handle errors here. So it's really not a uh, mystery, but I'll, I'll leave the, all the details to, to him because you're going to see it in the presentation. It's quite nice. But yeah, you can handle errors, and it's, it's just not a problem. Thanks. OK, one more. So many questions now. Uh -huh. Hi. So, if you're thinking about these uh, small little apps that you showed, they are easy to comprehend in cycles. But what if you have like a web store or something like that? Would you want to do sep several of these little cycles, or would you want to uh, make a really large app that somehow just merges all the different yeah. cycles together? Yeah, so um, when I showed the API, there were these two functions. One of them was apply to DOM, and the other one was register custom element. And the other one, the second one, we didn't use. Uh, and that basically creates kind of components of, of you know, React style. So you can build uh, components with Cycle, and the components are also uh, specified just like the, the computer function was. So it's also, so you could think of the components as uh, cycles also. So they're kind of mini programs, so yeah. And so basically the tools for build, building very large apps are components, uh, React style, and also just, you know, decomposing your function into smaller bits, and yeah. Okay, cool. Thanks for the good Awesome. Um, we have another speaker. Yeah. Um, one more round of applause, please.